So I was a city kid. I grew up in Vancouver in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, and I hate to admit it, but I loved Friday night TV dinners. Do you remember those awful things? Foil trays with frozen food that was reheated. Yeah, they resembled airline fare, but we valued that convenience over quality. And I never questioned how my food was produced. About nine years ago, I moved to Saskatchewan in the heart of the Canadian prairies with my husband and two little boys. And it was the first time that I really came to understand what the industrial food system really looked like. Driving on prairie roads, you see these miles and miles of endless monoculture crops of wheat and canola. And you see huge equipment, and all of this land is doused with toxic chemical cocktail mixtures uh, multiple times in the season. It seemed like just a fight against nature. But in stark contrast, you also will see that the region is full of exceptional wildlife and biodiversity. This is uh, one of my most famous or favorite examples of a symbol of prairie spring, the meadowlark, who sits up on his fence post, belting out his powerful song across the prairie fields. And as an ecotoxicologist and as a scientist, I was really curious and fascinated to learn about what this industrial food system might be doing to the water, the bugs, and the birds that I love to study. But as a mother and as a nature lover, I definitely had concerns. Now, you all probably have heard all of those common reports in the media about how things are in our wild spaces are really becoming more rare, the bees, the bugs, and the birds. And it's true, worldwide, 40% of the insects are gone, and it's predicted that they'll be gone within a century. And for the birds, many of the farmland birds, over 50% in uh, Europe and 70% in North America, are in seeing staggering declines. And it's not just the rare species that are disappearing, it's the common farmland birds, things like the barn swallow pictured here, or the red-winged blackbird, or even the more successful uh, invasive species like the European starling. So I asked myself this question, what have we changed in our environment that are making these common farmland birds disappear in my lifetime? So one hypothesis is that pesticides are to blame. And starting in the 30s and 40s, we started to produce synthetic chemicals like DDT in vast quantities. And really, as a society, we were intoxicated not by these chemicals per se, but by the idea that we could revolutionize our, all of our problems and fix everything in a bottle. And we also thought these things were completely safe. Now, you might think that we don't do that anymore, right? That, you know, pesticides are all tightly regulated and, and you know, we probably don't use that much anymore. Well, I wish you were right, but actually the statistics are incredible. Globally, we use 5.8 billion pounds of pesticides every year. It's a $56 billion a year industry, and that number is rising. Today, the chemicals we use are maybe not as visible, but they are often much more potent. And insecticides like the new neonicotinoids that are um, often you hear about in the press, these things are actually about a thousand times more toxic to insects than DDT. Now, the first neonicotinoid, imidacloprid, went by various trade names like Admire and Gaucho. Pretty impressive, right? And then there were chemical derivatives that followed with equally impressive trade names like Calypso and Prosper. Now, you might think, how did these become so popular? How did they rise to become the most commonly used insecticides in the world? Well, it actually comes down to their chemistry. These were made to be uh, targeting insect neurons better than humans which should be making them safer. 
They were also designed to be water soluble. And the reason this is important is because they could be used as seed treatments. And the idea was then that you could apply them to the coating of the seed, the plant would take it up as it grows, and it's really easy for farmers because they buy the seed with this built-in protection. Now, the Government of Canada actually does not keep careful or accurate records of the sales and use of pesticides. So our lab has done some investigative digging and analysis, and we have found that the prairie provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba actually are the highest users of neonicotinoids in Canada. We use a staggering 215,000 kilograms every year, and this is across 20 million hectares of land. Now, that number is big, but it's actually not that surprising because virtually every single canola seed has the neonicotinoid seed coating, and up to half of the other crops also have the neonicotinoids on them. Now, we've gone out and literally sampled hundreds of prairie wetlands, uh, uh, like the ones pictured here. And there's me styling my sexy waders. You're looking good. Well, we, my students are hard at work, often in the field, collecting data from these wetlands, including taking water samples and invertebrate samples out of those wetlands. And in our research, we were shocked to find that in the springtime, even before the farmers have put uh, any seed in the ground, when we sampled those wetlands, up to 90% of them had detectable levels of neonicotinoids in them already. And often they were in mixtures of more than one neonicotinoid. And our research also has shown that the levels that they reach in these wetlands are high enough to cause effects on macroinvertebrates, little midges, these aquatic insects that are so important for the ecosystem. So you might not care about midges, but actually this bird really does. As you can see from the picture, he's got a mouthful of these things. And these are the lifeblood of the prairies. These little midges emerge in huge pulses. They're a nutritious insect food for birds like the tree swallow. And we know that these birds will actually fly further, stay away from their nests longer, just to get those food. And in turn, the food supply, or lack of it, is enough to cause those birds to have lower reproductive success, they'll have smaller chicks, and even affect their own survival and chance of returning the next year. Now it's bigger than that. I told you that neonicotinoids were used as that seed treatment. Well, we actually wondered what would happen if we had some migrating birds, little songbirds that stop in these agricultural fields and pick up the seeds accidentally or on purpose as a free food, and what would happen to them if they ate just a few of those seeds? So we designed a couple of cool studies, and I'll tell you about them. We used this bird, the white-crowned sparrow, in our research, and we did two studies. In the first one, this experiment involved taking the birds into captivity. We dosed them for three days with the uh, neonicotinoid imidacloprid. And then we monitored them in captive behavioral trials to look at their migratory orientation, and we also, also measured their body mass. In the second study, we dosed them with half the dose, and this time just once. We only gave them a single dose, and we tracked their migration using tiny little radio transmitters that we attached to their backs. And this represented the first time that researchers could actually track the fate of a pesticide-exposed bird in the wild. Okay, what did we find? Well, in those captive trials, we actually gave the birds the neonicotinoid for three days. And this line here shows the controls. You can see it doesn't change that much, their body mass. It pretty much, they stayed the same in captivity. When we gave them a low dose of neonicotinoids, this is what happened. They lost up to 17% of their body mass in just three days. When we gave them a little bit more, they lost up to 25% of their body mass, a quarter of their body weight in three days. 
They also became disoriented in the migration trials, losing their northward compass. And the amount that we were giving them to cause this effect was just the equivalent of eating a few treated seeds with that neonicotinoid coating. So these results were pretty scary. But you might be wondering, what would happen in the wild, in the real world? Because these were all in captive studies. So when we took it out into the wild, we actually um, brought, we actually wanted to see what would happen. So we dosed the birds just once, and we released them into this MODIS telemetry network in southern Ontario. Now, all those yellow dots that you see on this map near the Great Lakes, those are automated radio telemetry towers, and each one can pick up the signal of those radio-tagged birds. So when we dosed them, we found again that they lost body weight really quickly, and a lot of this had to do with the fact that they just seemed to stop eating. But when we released them into the wild with their tags, we also found that, shockingly, these birds, the ones that received the neonicotinoid dose, they left three and a half days later than the controls from that stopover site. Now, birds are supposed to be, when they're migrating, stopping in these agricultural fields to rest and refuel. Well, when they encounter these treated seeds, those can be a hidden danger. This is a picture that my student took this spring uh, in Saskatchewan, where you can see these huge piles of neonicotinoid treated seeds. And just a small handful of these seeds is enough to kill a songbird. And our research shows a couple of those seeds is enough to cause them to become anorexic and lose their migration ability. Now, my hero, Rachel Carson, a revolutionary scientist for her time, she predicted this dire situation over 50 years ago when she published the book Silent Spring. And she said this, I quote her, why would anyone believe that it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without causing it making it unfit for life. So many people have thought, well, the solution must be just ban the chemicals, right? Just get rid of the most harmful ones. Well, in 2017, Health Canada's PMRA actually proposed a ban on imidacloprid. And here we are almost two years later, and it's still on hold. In places like Europe, they actually have banned neonicotinoids. And, you know, guess what? They still grow a crop. But do you think the problem is gone? I would be willing to bet that it's really not going to do much. Why? Well, because I think that there's a secret that I should let you in on. The chemical industry is already producing alternative pesticides to the neonicotinoids. And these are now already in widespread use. We've been testing for them in our water sampling over the last couple of years. And in fact, we found that one in five of the wetlands that we sampled had two of the new replacement chemicals, chlorantriloprol, cyantriloprol. And even more alarming, the lab tests that we've done with these chemicals show that they are as toxic or even more toxic to the little aquatic midge. Yeah than even its predecessor, imidacloprid. So, a few years ago, I woke up tired, conflicted. On one hand, the conservation organizations, they wanted me to be the champion for a neonicotinoid ban. And on the other hand, the agricultural industry had already tagged me as the evil villain for the research that I was doing. And I could see that Banning single chemicals was not the answer. It was like playing this game of whack-a-mole, right? Where you knock one out and another one appears. So it just it made me realize that agricultural pesticides are not the problem per se. It's just a symptom of our broken agricultural system that relies on the solution in a bottle. And you know what? It's costly. In Saskatchewan, two-thirds of the farm costs are actually seed and chemical. So 
The solution, though, is actually right under our feet. And it can make economic sense. What if we spent more time, more money, and more policy incentivizing and empowering farmers to make their farms more resilient, to plant more diverse crops, to uh, plant perennial forages in the right places, to integrate livestock into these systems and eat the crop stubble, and all in a much more uh, integrated system that instead of fighting nature, we work with it. There's some positive benefits, of course. We get more good bugs, we get more birds, we get better soil, and it also is cheaper. And the farmers that are doing this say it works. Now, since the DDT era, farmers have been told that the solution is in a bottle or with the next genetically modified crop. But I want my kids to grow up hearing birds, seeing insects, signs that we are doing it right. So please, listen to the birds. They're telling us there is a better way to grow food. Thank you. <laughs>